this is the AMX-30 main battle tank from France. And I am really intrigued by this tank because I had no idea once again that it existed. A lot of people have asked me to do a video on this tank and I have a massive respect for the Leclerc main battle tank of France. And uh, I think we need to get into this vehicle because it's a little bit of its predecessor bringing it up to French main battle tanks of today. And I would love to know what your favorite main battle tank is let me know in the comment section below and let me know why it's always interesting seeing you guys put a tank in the comment section and the type of tank but let me know your reasons as to why you like it and i'm quite fascinated by french tanks because the french get a pretty hard time with the whole white flag retreat thing and i think particularly for this tank it is not fair to be kind of pushing that kind of agenda on the french military they have a lot of respect globally in the way in which they can provide very good armor support particularly with the leclerc but the amx 30 was really a cold war struggle and it did not fare well in the nature of modern armored warfare for many reasons and we're going to deep dive into it today so let's get into its features what it's all about and the beautiful amx 30. developed during a time of shifting alliances and evolving battlefield threats the amx 30 was designed to be fast mobile and lethal for the french army but, unfortunately, World War II had left France's armoured forces in a very weakened state, including its design and engineering group. With an urgent need for a modern main battle tank, France initially looked to collaborate with other NATO nations. However, what began as a multinational effort to create a standardised European tank collapsed, leading France to go its own way, and this is why I respect the story of how the AMX-30 was born. France's tank industry was truly in disarray after the Second World War, and the country's primary tank, the AMX-13, was really a light reconnaissance vehicle, not a main battle tank. France attempted to develop a medium-heavy tank, the AMX-50, but this project failed due to logistical and design issues. In the meantime, the French army relied on the M47 Patton tanks supplied by the United States Army under the Mutual Defense Aid Program. France, West Germany and Italy recognized the need for a modern European main battle tank. In 1956, they launched the Europa Panzer Project, an ambitious effort to create a shared tank for NATO forces. The goal was to develop a 30-ton vehicle with superior mobility and firepower capable of countering the growing Soviet tank threat, and it certainly was growing at that time period. The French firm Altier de Construction de Lys Le Menu AMX and the West German firm Porsche began developing competing prototypes. By the early 1960s, political and strategic differences caused tensions within the project. France wanted to use its domestically designed 105mm CN105 F1 rifled gun, while West Germany favoured the British L7 105mm gun, a prestigious gun of its time. And I'm of course going to say that because I'm British and I'm <coughs> not the French. I'm just kidding. Which had already been standardised by NATO. Another point of contention was the engine. France wanted a diesel-powered multi-fuel engine, whereas West Germany preferred a gasoline-based power plant. At the same time, France was beginning to distance itself a little bit from NATO's military structure overall under President Charles de Gaulle. This shift led to Germany officially withdrawing from the joint program in 1963, marking the end of the Europa Panzer project. Instead, as many of you know, Germany proceeded with its own tank, the gorgeous Leopard 1, while France pressed on with an independent design, which became the AMX-30. By 1960, France had produced its first AMX-30 prototype. Over the next few years, further refinements were made, resulting in the final production model by 1963. The AMX-30 was officially and formally adopted by the French army in 1966, marking a bit of a turning point in France's armoured warfare strategy. Now, the AMX-30 was designed with one key principle in mind. Armour is mostly obsolete. By the 1950s, tank designers were grappling with a harsh reality. No matter how thick armour plating was, modern heat or high explosive anti-tank rounds and guided missiles could penetrate it. The French military at the time believed that instead of trying to keep up in an armour race that they really couldn't win, they should focus on mobility and firepower. This result was a tank that was lighter, faster, and somewhat more maneuverable than many of its contemporaries of the West. Weighing at just 36 tons, the AMX-30 is one of the lightest main battle tanks of its time. In comparison, the M60 Patton weighed 50 tons, the Chieftain was close to 55 tons, and even the beautiful Leopard 1 was heavier at 42 tons. 
The AMX 30s lighter frame allowed it to reach speeds of up to 65 kilometers an hour or 40 miles per hour, making it one of the fastest NATO tanks of its generation. However, this came at a cost. Its armor was extremely thin. The frontal hull armor was only 50 millimeters thick, and while the turret had a maximum of 80 millimeters. Sadly, this meant that the AMX 30 was vulnerable to almost every single anti tank weapon and gun of its era. Even against the older Soviet tanks like the T-55, the AMX-30 had to rely on its speed and positioning rather than its armor for survival, and when you have a main battle tank, relying purely on speed and mobility is certainly not going to cut it in the Cold War era. But while its armor was lacking, its firepower was anything but lacking. The 105mm CN-105 F1 rifle cannon that the French basically died on a hill to keep was a quite highly capable weapon. Unlike other NATO tanks that relied on armor-piercing discarding Sabos, the AMX-30 used an innovative heat round called the Obus G. This was a unique shell that solved a major problem with heat rounds. Rifled guns normally spin their projectiles for accuracy, but this disrupts the shape charge inside the heat shell, making it less effective. The Obus G got around this by using an inner core that remained stable while the outer shell spun, preserving the explosive jet's penetrating power on impact. As a result, the Obus G could penetrate up to 400 millimeters of armor at any range, making it fairly effective at most Soviet tank engagements. Another unusual feature for this tank was its coaxial 20 millimeter autocannon. While most tanks of the era had a machine gun mounted next to the main gun with a 7.62 millimeter configuration, the AMX-30's F2 autocannon could engage lightly armored vehicles, low-flying helicopters, and even enemy tank optics, giving it a more versatile and standard setup than a normal machine gun. The AMX-30 was also equipped with a nuclear, biological, and chemical protection system, allowing it to operate in contaminated environments. This was a crucial feature during the Cold War, as both NATO and Warsaw Pacts expected large-scale conflicts involving nuclear or chemical weapons. Unfortunately, the system that was integrated to the AMX-30 was not very ideal. Interesting that they had so much space to put things on there and very low weight, but they actually cheaped out on the MBC systems. Something you certainly don't want to cheap out on if you're going in contested environments with that kind of setup. Despite these strengths though, the AMX-30 had a huge weakness. Its fire control system. Early models relied on optical range finders, meaning the gunner had to manually estimate distances and adjust fire accordingly. Unfortunately, this was a massive disadvantage against tanks that could do a lot better, like the M60 and Leopard 1, which had a very advanced fire control system, particularly at the time Chieftain. It wasn't until the AMX 30B2 upgrade in 1979 that a laser rangefinder and thermal optics were added, significantly improving its accuracy, but at this time, it was just far too late. With the production of the AMX 30 fully beginning in 1966, the assembly took place at the Atelier de Construction de Rouen, or the Airy Factory. The French army initially ordered 300 tanks, but as the years went on, production expanded significantly. By the mid 1980s, over 1,170 AMX 30s had been built for France, with additional models exported to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Greece, Spain, and Cyprus. The AMX 30 wasn't just a tank, though, it became an entire family of armored vehicles to meet different battlefield requirements, and several specialized variants were developed. The AMX 30B2 was introduced in 1979 with the upgraded version featuring a semi-automatic transmission, a new fire control system, and an improved power plant. It was also fitted with advanced thermal sight and laser range finders, as I had mentioned before, which addressed some of the weaknesses of the original model, but still really wasn't quite meeting up to the match, just like it isn't on this hill right now. And speaking of getting stuck on the hill, there was also some non-tank variants such as the AMX-30D armored recovery vehicle. Unfortunately, due to the power plant that the tank originally had, the recovery vehicle was not very good at actually recovering the vehicle with the power plant it had, it just didn't have enough juice. There was also the AMX-30 Roland self-propelled anti-aircraft missile system, and the AMX-30 Pluton, which carried France's tactical nuclear missile systems. One of the most significant upgrades came in the 1990s with the Brinus package, which added explosive reactive armor to improve survivability against modern anti-tank weapons. However, despite these upgrades, the AMX-30 was gradually phased out as more advanced tanks entered service. 
But let's be very clear, in terms of mobility, the AMX-30 was the benchmark for the fastest and most maneuverable tank of its time. With the Hispano Souza HS110 diesel engine producing around about 750 to 780 horsepower, it could reach speeds of up to 40 miles per hour off road and up to 50 miles per hour on roads. It had excellent power to weight ratios, allowing it to accelerate quickly and navigate difficult terrain with ease. Its torsion bar suspension system provided very good stability, but the original manual transmission was notoriously difficult for operation, leading to huge mechanical issues. This was later fixed, as I had mentioned, with the AMX 30B2 with a semi automatic SESM EN C200 transmission, which really improved its reliability. However, the actual gun itself did have a couple of issues. It lacked a stabilized platform at first, meant the firing on the move was near impossible. While later models introduced some stabilization features, earlier versions required the tank to completely stop before taking an accurate shot. Now in the Cold War, that wasn't a huge issue because most of the time the West would have been in defensive positions anyway, but it did put a lot of disadvantage against other tanks with capabilities that did have it, like the M60 Patton and the Chieftain, which had a lot better stabilization and fire control. The armor of this tank was an absolute killer though, and it unfortunately did pose a huge threat to its crews, and crews were nervous about utilizing this tank as a main battle tank. If you're going up against Russian armor, you're going to want to have at least something more than 50 millimeters to protect you, and it was at a late stage to fix a long-standing problem by adding armor packages on there. Of course, the tank never actually saw true combat in the Cold War, but it did see combat in certain multiple conflicts, serving in both the French army and several foreign militaries. Despite those design limitations, it proved to be a fairly capable tank in the right circumstances, particularly in engagements where mobility and firepower was prioritized over armor. One of its major first combat tests was actually during the Gulf War in 1991. French forces deployed the AMX 30 B2s as part of Operation Daguette, France's contribution to the coalition effort to liberate Kuwait. While its primary tank battles were involved with the American M1 Abrams, British Challengers, and Iraqi T-72s, French AMX-30s engaged Iraqi armored forces in several skirmishes, particularly on the flanks. The AMX-30B2's laser rangefinder and upgraded fire control system gave it the advantage over the Iraqi T-55s and Type 69 tanks, which were equipped with inferior optics and night firing capabilities. French forces were very successful at engaging and destroying multiple Iraqi armored vehicles while avoiding heavy direct engagements. However, the AMX-30's thin armor remained a liability and French tank crews had to rely on speed and strategic positioning to avoid direct hits from enemy ATGMs and tank rounds, and they were very well trained in doing so. Qatar's AMX-30s also saw action in the Gulf War. Qatari forces equipped with AMX-30s engaged Iraqi T-55s and BMP-1 infantry fighting vehicles in urban combat. The AMX-30s successfully repelled the Iraqi advance, destroying multiple enemy vehicles and holding their positions despite sustaining some losses. In addition to the Gulf War, the AMX-30 was used in other conflicts across the Middle East and Africa. Saudi Arabian AMX-30s were deployed against healthy rebel forces in Yemen, but due to their vulnerability to modern anti-tank weapons, they were eventually phased out in more modern, favored vehicles. The AMX-30's chassis was also used in combat in a different role, as an artillery platform. Yes, fellow gunners are like me are interested in this one. The AMX-30 AF-1 self-propelled howitzer was used in the same hull and was deployed during the Iran-Iraq War in 1980-88, providing long-range fire support for Iraqi forces against Iranian armored units. While the AMX-30 wasn't as heavily involved in major tank battles as some of its NATO counterparts, its proved effectiveness in limited engagements is respected, particularly against outdated enemy armor. However, as the 1990s progressed, it became clear that the AMX-30 was reaching the end of its combat viability. There were several upgrades, as I mentioned, over the years added to this platform, but the French were basically saying it's time to look at the next generation, and in the 2000s, France had completely retired the AMX-30 in favor of the beautiful Leclerc main battle tank. Despite its shortcomings, the AMX-30 was respected to its exported several countries. The nations that used these vehicles in a variety of roles upgraded them as much as they could, but once again, Spain, for example, made its own AMX-30 E variant, which included domestic modifications, but sooner or later, a generation of this tank across the globe was phased out. 
While it never saw widespread adaptation of tanks like the Leopard 1 or the M60 Patton, it still played a key role in deterrent in the Cold War era of tank exports, helping France maintain a defensive industry independence. And that is why I really respect this tank. It wasn't the be-all and end-all of heavy-duty main battle tanks, but France made it. They made it themselves. They procured everything that they needed to make of this gun, platform, chassis themselves. And that's a big deal for me. By the 1990s, though, the MX-30 was completely obsolete as a frontline battle tank. The development of third-generation MBTs like the Abrams, Challenger 2, and Leopard 2 left it completely outclassed, and France decided to pull the plug and get on with bigger, larger tasks. When they actually retired it, a lot of heavily armored and highly advanced tank designs were proposed, but once again, France said, you know what, we're going to do this ourselves again, and the Leclerc was an important part of its tank history representing a unique design philosophy that prioritized armor this time and firepower over its mobility, the Leclerc was a bit of a lessons learned. So for me, massive hats off to the MX-30. I do really think it looks like a tank's tank. And what do I mean by a tank's tank? Well, when you look at Cold War era tanks, you know, like the Leopard 1 and even the Chieftain, they just look like a main battle tank. And the MX-30, although it doesn't have internally or even on its exterior, the actual features of what you would expect of a main battle tank, it just looks like one. It's actually, I think, quite a well-designed platform and chassis. That 105mm gun was quite renowned for its time, and of course not the L7, but it didn't need to be the L7. Everyone was trying to pick the L7. France decided to do their own thing, and you have to give them some respect for that, which is why this video has kind of a second meaning to it. Stop giving France a hard time about retreating and all the white flag BS. France has done very well at making an armoured fleet, both with the AMX-30 and the Leclerc, and I have a lot of respect for them. I would love to be able to one day see one of these tanks up close, particularly the AMX-30, because it just seems like a kind of classic Cold War era armour tank that is just a roller skate. It is fast, it is mobile and lightweight, and I really like that a you know, 105mm gun is put on a platform like this and could travel at Mach 10 where it needs to go. Let's just hope, though, it doesn't get spotted and engaged because the paper-thin armor is certainly not going to be very good for that crew inside. What do you think of the AMX-30 and its global reach, its speed, its firepower? I'd love to hear your comments in the comment section below. If you do want to support my channel, please go check out the description box for my Patreon and my PayPal. Some of you have been sending super chats in the comment section as well. I cannot thank you enough for your financial support to this channel. It really means a lot to me. So truly from the bottom of my heart, thank you. But I would encourage you to keep your money. You know, in all honesty, uh, times are tough. So uh, if you, you are donating and you, you really don't need to, keep your money. Uh, I appreciate you all anyway. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe and click the bell for more notifications. All the best, folks. Bye-bye.